Assalamu alaikum everyone. Juma uh, Mubaraka. My name is Jalal Khashib. I'm Senior Research Associate at SIGA, the Center for Islam and Global Affairs. Uh, today is Friday, May 15th, Ramadan 22. Uh, on behalf of SIGA, I would like to welcome you on our new uh, lecture in this seminar, uh, webinar uh, series during Ramadan. Uh, <clears throat> today we have uh, we have a new lecture uh, with new topic uh, entitled "Ending the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict: Geopolitical Analysis." Uh, and uh, I have the honor to moderate to moderate this uh, today's lecture. Uh, uh, with the, uh, and the, uh, the the presentation will be uh, presented by Professor uh, Dr. Sami Alarian. Dr. Sami Alarian is the director of Stiga and the professor of public affairs uh, at Istanbul uh, Sabah Design University, based here in Turkey. Uh, he received his PhD in the United States, in the United States, 1986, uh, and uh, Dr. Sami. Uh, is is a good example for uh, for what Gramsci uh, what Gramsci called the, the organic intellectual the the intellectual who uh, who always supports his uh, people's case uh, not only by words but but by actions too uh, and uh, as all you know Professor uh, Dr Sami has an spiritual story in this regard. And he will be talking about it, I think, uh, next week, inshallah. Uh, Dr. Sabi is one of the famous scholars in Muslim world and uh, active advocate for human rights for Palestinian cases. Uh, and uh, he have uh, he is also uh, the founder of many institutions in education and human rights and so on. Uh, besides his activism, he is also a very active uh, author and he has many and thousands of articles, books and the studies uh, focusing on the US foreign policy toward Middle East uh, and with, with special focus on the Palestinian cases and, uh, and the human rights in general. Uh, Dr. Sami has uh, uh, many books also. Books also, uh, one of them uh, is about the Arab awakening, uh, understanding transformations and re revolution in the Middle East, published in uh, 2013. And his last book is about uh, the United States and Israel from enabler strategic from enabler to strategic part. Uh, and was published uh, last year. Uh, uh, please join me to welcome Professor Dr. Sami. Dr. Sami, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Jalal, very much for your generous introduction. Uh, what I will try to do today is to address the topic is to address the topic which is ending Israeli or the israeli Palestinian conflict a geopolitical analysis and in this presentation what I'll try to do is simply to present uh, different epistemological and strategic imperatives that supports the presence and existence of the state of Israel and I will uh, I will probably present 12 of them and uh, the end of the conflict is going to be determined pretty much on the continuation of these imperatives or the, uh, the, the frozen or the 
uh, collapse of some of these uh, imperatives. And then we will have uh, some conclusion. So let me start uh, by sharing my uh, PowerPoint presentation. <coughs> <clears throat> what I will do again is to present at the beginning the genesis of the conflict. What is the problem? What is the core of the Israeli-Palestinian problem? How did it start? And then I'll try to uh, present uh, the Zionist state and, uh, and and how it presented itself. And again, the imperatives, the strategic imperatives it depended on and it uh, sustains its uh, its existence. And then we will <clears throat> talk uh, ap after that, uh, the most likely end of the conflict scenarios. Now, for centuries, the world witnessed two Jewish communities, the Jews of Islam, as Bernard Lewis and Ismail Farouqi called them, and the Jews of Christendom, that is, those who lived in the Christian West and Russia. Ever since the constitution of Medina, and here I have a, a, uh, a slide that shows uh, this particular constitution in which it recognized Jews as part of the community, community of Muslims when the Prophet established, Prophet Muhammad that is, established the first state uh, in Medina. Ever since that constitution in the first year of the Islamic calendar, Jewish communities and tribes in Arabia were recognized. And and not only recognized, but they were recognized as an intrinsic part of the so-called ummah or community, community of believers. For centuries thereafter, Jews lived in peace and security with Muslims and other faith communities throughout the Arab and Muslim world, creating what Jewish encyclopedia calls the Jewish golden age, where Jewish philosophy, culture, and scholarship thrived. Now, of course, there were episodes but these episodes have to be taken into context, especially with those episodes in Medina itself, shortly after the Jewish communities were recognized, there were different skirmishes and fights and battles because of uh, political reasons, obviously not because of their faith. Now, according to, to Lewis, Bernard Lewis that is, the Jewish people were allowed to practice their religion and live according to the laws and scriptures of their community. He described the regulations under which the Jewish communities were subjected, where he says they were social and symbolic, rather than tangible and practical in character. That is to say, those regulations served to define the relationship between the two communities and not to oppress the Jewish population, and we have to look at it certainly uh, in terms of the uh, context of the time. This is what Bernard Lewis said. Now, <clears throat> later, when the Inquisition was taking place, the Jewish communities, of course, there were uh, many persecutions against them as well as the Muslims, and they have to move and scatter and be exiled, and they were forced Jewish immigration, much of which was to Muslim countries, Muslim lands. <coughs> you will find, for example, that uh, uh, historians tell us that over 100,000 Jews at the time uh, were either forced to uh, convert to Christianity or they were massacred, and almost over 200,000 were immigrated to Muslim lands. On the other hand, was was taking place, Jewish communities in Europe lived for centuries in ghettos after they immigrated and they, they, they came to different European towns and cities. They were discriminated against, ostracized, marginalized, and barely tolerated. The list of the social, legal, and religious incapacities and vulnerabilities is long, where every new Christian ruler would add to it. Professor Ismail Farouqi listed in his great book, Islam and the Problem of Israel, some of the prohibitions and restrictions imposed on the Jewish communities in Europe. Unless the Jewish communities lived in their own ghettos, they may not employ Christians, 
they may not disinherit their Christian or their Christian children, those children who converted to Christianity, they must convert if they marry a Christian, they shall be ruled by Roman by Roman law rather than Torahic law, that is the law of the Torah. They shall not criticize Christian doctrines, nor give evidence against Christians in courts. They shall not celebrate Jewish feasts, practice circumcision, or refrain from eating pork. They shall submit to baptism, refrain from practicing their customs, punished if they work on Sundays, because Sunday obviously is a holiday in the Christian land where it's not, it's the beginning of the week for Jews. They shall not appear in public during certain Christian holidays. They shall not work in agriculture. They shall not hold public offices, nor practice medicine on Christians etc 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 you can see that the, the list is long in short european jews lived in such miserable conditions that they were practically forced to live in their own closed communities in order to escape these harsh realities as an example here is the alhambra de decree which came in 1492 at the <coughs> height of the inquisition by king ferdinand and his uh, wife as well. <coughs> and, and, and that basically it was the final line of the coffin that a Jew after centuries of persecution in Christian lands and after forced immigration and after massacres after massacres, it was decreed that they cannot live in those territories, in those kingdoms that that king, that Spanish king uh, ruled over unless they convert to Christianity, uh, leave the, the the lands or be massacred under inquisition and here are some of the horrible images that were taking place burnings and murders and knifings and trials to make sure and even uh, invasion of privacy to make sure for example that uh, they're not circumcised otherwise they would be punished now it is incontestable that the modern history of European or Western Jews is intertwined with European modern history. So as the rational age of European enlightenment dawned in the 17th and 18th centuries, when intellectual life was animated and where science and culture loosened, while church dogma gave way to reason, this is after the Reformation period. It was then that the European Jew who existed for centuries on sufferance was finally emancipated, or they thought so. As they came out of their ghettos, they had to learn the vernacular language of the land, the new languages of the people that they were now living with, mixing with, dealing with on a daily basis, and adopted as their own so they can, they become a culture. Within uh, the case. Sorry, sorry, professor. Uh, the slides, it doesn't appear. Okay. Uh, if you use slides, yeah. Okay, is it appearing now? Not now. Okay, let me check no. again, maybe it has. Yeah, I think there is. Okay, I think it stopped sharing for whatever reason. Is it sharing now? Not yet. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, thank you for letting me know. All right, so... Yeah. <clears throat> so as Jews came out of their ghettos, they had to learn the language of the people they are dealing with. They have to adopt it as their own. And within decades, many Jewish generations were assimilated or they thought so. Even many religious leaders and rabbis adopted new interpretations and scriptures. Uh, the interpretations of the scriptures that they were teaching for years, they had to adopt. And that's why we find, for example, as early as the 17th century, the new reformation uh, movement for, for Jews in, in the United States. <coughs> These were established 
uh, in, in, in many, many towns and cities across the United States with different religious uh, uh, traditions. Uh, we find today, for example, in, in the United States, at least three, the Reform, Judaism, and the, the Conservative, as well as the Orthodox, in addition to other minor ones. But this was a unique case in the U.S. because of the religious freedom guaranteed uh, in the U.S. Constitution. So they were able to institutionalize this, while others, it was more informal. But despite liberté, égalité, fraternité, the slogans of the French Revolution that promised everybody freedom and, and, and the ability to, to, uh, to assimilate and to be independent and to thrive, the assimilated and secular Jew still had to endure hatred, suspicion, and discrimination. As Theodor Herzl, the founder of political Zionism in the 19th century, had witnessed firsthand as a journalist. When he <coughs> covered the Alfred Dreyfus affair, or the Alfred tri uh, Dreyfus trial in Paris, a, a, a French soldier who was accused of betraying France, being a traitor, and was tried falsely, I should add, and at, they attributed that to his Jewishness in 1894. This is, uh, this is the journal that came accusing him, and this is Alfred Dreyfus. And of course, that was overturned later, but that showed, that was the beginning, that is the genesis of how the assimilated secular Jew like Theodore Herzl thought that we cannot live, we cannot live in France, we cannot live in Germany, we cannot live in Austria, we cannot live in Europe. And therefore, uh, with the, with the, uh, uh, with the uh, rise of the nation state system, they were thinking in, in those terms. But despite the Enlightenment ideas that proliferated throughout Europe, with the exception of Russia, by the way, because they did not take root, these ideas didn't take root, the 19th century was the age of rampant nationalism and romanticism in Europe. So the lesson learned by this agnostic Jew, Herzl, turned rampant Zionist, was that Jews would never be accepted or live safely anywhere. It was this manifestly anti-Jewish attitudes by racist Europe that convinced the early Zionists that Europe would never tolerate its Jews. This experience had set them on their quest to adopt an ideology, which is political Zionism, by asserting Jewish nationalism with all the diseases and fault lines of ethnocentrism, inventing practically a new religion to emancipate the Jews from what they perceive as the incurable disease of anti-Semitism that was accumulating over centuries. It was a completely European experience, fueled by discriminatory and dangerous practices, such as the Russian pogroms of the late 1800s, 1880s, and beyond up to the uh, beginning of the 19th century. And of course, the worst of all was under Nazi Germany, with the Holocaust. These experiences had no equivalence for Jews who lived within the Muslim world. As I said, you know, the, the massacre, for example, uh, in 1391 against the Jews in Portugal took <coughs> the lives of almost 4,000. There is no similar experience for Jews in any Muslim land, and this is only one massacre. We didn't even count the pogroms in Russia and other Programs. There were at least 200 incidents in Russia alone where tens of thousands of people lost either their lives, their livelihood, uh, they were just victims of these discriminatory practices. But Muslims, Jews, didn't have these experiences in Muslim lands. In fact, when the Jews were expand, expelled, as I said earlier, from Spain in the 15th century, they settled in large numbers across the Muslim world. They were welcomed to live within Muslim communities, even here in Istanbul. That's when they started coming, which was the site of the Caliphate, which was the capital of the Caliphate. Including, of course, some settled in Palestine, but not necessarily 
just a so few of them, not, not a lot. <clears throat> the tragedy of Palestine is therefore a direct consequence of intolerable Europe, including Russia, I might add, directing their racism and xenophobia against their European Jews. But what would make this far-fetched Zionist fantasy a reality was a calculating colonialist scheme hatched in London to ensure not only the permanent incapacitation of the Ottoman Empire, but also the permanent <coughs> fragmentation of the Arab world in particular and the Muslim world in general. The, Pal the, the Balfour Declaration in 1917, <coughs> towards the end of the First World War, was born out of this unholy alliance between the Zionist movement that started in 1897 with the first Zionist World Zionist Congress by Herzl and went through uh, uh, year after year by expanding its presence among Jewish communities and its colonial benefactors without any regards to the indigenous people of the land or the impact on the people of the region. For over a century, the Zionists adopted, the Zionist movement that is, adopted an aggressive and belligerent program for the purpose of establishing an exclusive Jewish state in Palestine. This dangerous movement and the state it created were guided by many strategic imperatives, as I said at the beginning, that must be totally understood and comprehended if we are ever able to confront the destruction it has brought, not only to Palestinians, but to the whole region and also to the whole world. The suffering it unleashed and the threat it exposed to the Palestinians, <coughs> to the Arabs, to the Muslims, but also to the Jews around the world and indeed to the entire world. I will argue in my presentation that in order to achieve peace, not only in Palestine and the region, but also for the entire humanity, the political Zionist movement and its project in Palestine must be confronted and totally defeated. And all its institutions must be dismantled and disbanded. Note that I'm differentiating, and this is very crucial, very important, very significant, between Zionist institutions and the Jewish people. They are not the same. Our quest must be to save the true essence of Jewish culture and Jewish life from the dangerous Zionist path towards destruction. <clears throat> now, let me start with the first strategic imperative that the Zionist movement had in mind. <coughs> First was exclusivism. What does that mean? Well, it means uh, for this imperative, it, the, the Zionist movement or Zionism calls for the ingathering of all or most Jews around the world in the historic land of Palestine. That is the essence. Even though at the beginning, they were not very exclusivist about Palestine in general, they were just about transferring Jews from around the world. But eventually, in order to unite Jews, they asserted that Palestine is the only place where they could come and bring all Jews. So it has this exclusivist mindset that only Jews can settle and live in the uh, land of Palestine, the Holy Land of Palestine. Uh, this came very early on. Theodor Herzl, for example, uh, said Zionism demands a publicly recognized and legally secured homeland in Palestine for the Jewish people. This platform is unchangeable. He died, by the way, in 1904, and he was uh, very disappointed because he thought that his project has collapsed and was not going anywhere after the Sultan uh, Abdul Hamid, the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, refused all his gestures. We can go from the first to the last leader. Here's uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, in which uh, he says last year, just last year, uh, with all the things that have taken place, with the fact that you have all these Palestinians living in the historic land of Palestine today, he says Israel is the national state, not of all its citizens, but only of the Jewish people. That tells you this exclusivist mind, that's all what you need to know about this 
Zionist imperative of this ex exclusivist mind where you have it's like a caste system where Jews come on top and everybody else would not count or would be subsidiary. <coughs> the national state, we're talking about 21st century, after the fall of apartheid, after everything that has happened uh, in the last century and early this century, Israel is the national state, not of all its citizens, but only of the Jewish people. So the first imperative for the Zionists, the first principle, is to keep Israel Jewish. That is, to be an exclusivist state for the Jews. What does that entail? Well, it entails the second. Uh, but before we go to the second, let's see what the historical record shows. In 1800, uh, Jews were only 2.5%. In 1882, they rose to 5%. So all under the Ottomans. Towards the end of the 19th century, they were about 8%. Towards after the British mandate, shortly after, was 11%. And then their number increased drastically, dramatically, because of the British mandate over Palestine and the ability to the, colon to the to colonial Britain that was ruling over Palestine to allow uh, unlimited, for a time, Jewish immigration, which raised the total number to about 32% of, uh, of Jews in Palestine. And the indigenous people were about uh, 60%, actually 67.5% uh, between Muslims and Christians. By 1967, when Israel took over all of Palestine, uh, certainly, uh, the number rose to about 90, uh, about uh, 86 or so percent. And then today, in the historic land, in the 1948 areas, they number about 79 percent, while the Arabs who stayed after the mass uh, exile and mass deportation uh, of, Pal of Palestinians during 1948 war, and these are their descendants, about a million and a half, about 2 percent. The table <coughs> on the right-hand side is the Palestinians on the other part under occupation or siege in the West Bank and Gaza. Now, when you examine the total number in the historic land of Palestine, the Palestinians have already exceeded the Jewish population. Uh, when you add both the Palestinians uh, uh, in the 1948 areas, the Palestinians in the West Bank, the Palestinians in Gaza, we're not even talking about the Palestinians in the diaspora, who number uh, possibly as much as 8 or 9 million. So here we have even that first imperative, even though it, it brought many Jews into Palestine, it has failed to have an exclusive uh, 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 presence of Jews only in Palestine due to the fact that the Palestinians have resisted this throughout the years. They have learned the lesson of the 1948. They stayed in 1967. They didn't go away. They didn't, even though they were, millions were, for, hundreds of thousands were forced. The majority stayed and they came back and they are insisting to stay there. And of course, add to that the high birth rate. Let's see. All right, the <coughs> second imperative is exclusion. One is exclusivism, the second is exclusion, and in this imperative, Zionism calls for the expulsion, exile, or banishment of all or as many Palestinians from the historic land of Palestine as possible. So while you admit all the Jews, anybody who claimed to be a Jew, even if they are not Jew, like we, we, we saw hundreds of thousands of, of Russians who claimed to be Jewish or of Jewish ancestry with no proof, and therefore they were, even with that, uh, um, that uh, claim, which which was not uh, a very weak claim, uh, they were they were allowed in and given citizenship and given rights, and yet Palestinians are totally denied uh, the the uh, the return, the right of return. So here Zionism is has, has been very consistent in that, in which it calls for the total expulsion and exile and banishment of all the Palestinians from coming back to their land, and that has been consistent Zionist policy throughout the years. Now, 
for that to happen, they had to destroy property and villages. <coughs> what you see on the left-hand side is a historic map of Palestine uh, between 1948 until about 1950-51. Over 530, perhaps 32, 34 villages were totally destroyed. And every single village that was destroyed, another uh, mostly another uh, settlement or another city was constructed on top of it in order to erase Palestinian history from there. Uh, this has been detailed in many, many literature, including many books by uh, Dr. Ilan Pate. Uh, here is a letter from Ben-Gurion, who was the head of the uh, World Zionist Organization and the Jewish Agency and, and the Prime Minister for many years, <coughs> first Prime Minister, in which in 1937 he wrote, we must expel Arabs and take their place. No agreement was possible with the Palestinian Arab. He is trying, this is, this is another of the uh, um, leaders the, the revisionist, the, the person who is considered the father of the Likud, the father of the right-wing movement, Zeev Jabotinsky. Of course, Ben-Gurion was from uh, Polish ancestry, and uh, Jabotinsky was from Russia. He says no agreement was possible with the Palestinian Arab. They would accept Zionism only when they found themselves up against an iron wall, when they realized they had no alternative but to accept Jewish settlement. In other words, it has to be done by force, regardless of the consequence. This plan was there, uh, was, was in existence very early on. This was, didn't come gradually. This was part and parcel of the first Zionist project. The third one is expansion and colonization. This is Israel's manifest destiny. When we talked about America's manifest destiny last week, <coughs> how they can acquire and control as much land as possible from east to west, this was basically Israel's manifest destiny. And uh, in this imperative, Zionism calls for the gradual expansion of the Zionist state by seizing as much land as they can possibly do. And uh, we could see that over the years. You know, in 48, they had 78% of the land. In 67, uh, in 56, they tried actually um, um, uh, to take, but they were forced because of international geopolitical considerations, principally by President Eisenhower of the US at the time. But in 67, they were able to go and control the rest of Palestine in addition to Sinai and Golan Heights. And today, you could see how that progressed. Uh, we can see, for example, uh, some examples. This is the the Suez uh, campaign, the Suez Canal campaign in 56, it was always Israel who initiated these wars with one exception in 73. And I will explain that in a second. But here they went, of course, they went south, they went north, they went east. Uh, they, they tried to expand as much as east. They never went except for the West Bank uh, because of other considerations as well. <clears throat> but here we see also in the 1967 war on the right hand side, where they occupied the Sinai Peninsula, which is about two and a half the size of Palestine, as well as the Golan Heights. Uh, this campaign also was a deliberate attempt by Israel to expand, and all the propaganda that this was <coughs> because of Arab uh, invasion uh, is not true. And here is one of the, uh, another Prime Minister of Israel, one of the hawks, actually the leader of the coup, uh, Menachem Begin, who said in June 67, uh, we again had a choice. The Egyptian army concentrations in the Sinai approaches do not, and uh, uh, this is the quote I said, prove that Nasser, who was the president of Egypt at the time, was really about to attack us. We must be honest with ourselves. We decided to attack him, which is owned by the record. <clears throat> Moshe Dayan, who was the defense minister in 1967, gave the order to conquer the Golan on the uh, Syrian front. He said, and this is in an interview with New York Times, many of the firefights with the Syrians were deliberately provoked by Israel. And the kibbutz residents who pressed the government to take the Golan Heights did so less for security than for the farmland, he stated. 
they didn't even try to hide their greed for the land. He's talking about the settlers. We should send a tractor to plow some area where it wasn't possible to do anything in the demilitarized area, and knew in advance that the Syrians would start to shoot. He further said, if they didn't shoot, we would tell the tractor to advance further. So either they take the land <laughs> by, by forcing tractors, or they take it by forcing the tanks. Until in the end, the Syrians would get annoyed and shoot, and then we would use artillery and later the Air Force as well, and that's how it was. The Syrians on the fourth day of the war were not a threat to us. They were done. So that's how Israel uh, <coughs> expands itself. It's through gradual grabbing of the land. And of course, the world has seen this in the West Bank now over half a century, how they start taking one after the other. And that brings us to strat strategic imperative four, which is creating facts on the ground, what is called fait accompli. This is, of course, a geopolitical term that imposes a situation in reality as opposed to an abstract. In this imperative, the Zionist movement has used this strategy for over a century in order to obtain gradual and full control over all of Palestine, as well as other territories such as the Golan Heights in Syria and the Shabaa farms in Lebanon. And of course, over the years, many other territories, but for different reasons, they had to do a tactical retreat or a forced withdrawal. Here is uh, a map of the West Bank, which shows the expansion of settlements throughout. <coughs> In the middle here is the greater uh, area uh, of Jerusalem. And you could see uh, these expansions came over half century. Uh, today we have about 131 settlements and about 110 called outposts. Uh, that does not even include uh, military posts and uh, uh, what they call neighborhoods. So it just continue expansion under different names, all in violation of international law and successive UN resolutions that they really don't uh, uh, recognize and they don't respect. You could see here how uh, the encroachment, these are the borders of the 1948, what's called the Green Line, and how the encroachment of all these settlements to take as many Palestinian land as possible, including the, the, the Jordan Valley, which is on the, uh, the East Coast, which prevents any, any really meaningful uh, border between any Palestinian communities or entity even and uh, <coughs> Jordan. <coughs> Here is the, uh, this is really uh, uh, very much telling. This is this is the latest uh, Trump uh, Kushner Netanyahu map. You could see what this is about. I mean, at the end, the plan for the Palestinians, because they so far, they cannot uproot them. I mean, they were able to isolate the Gaza uh, people. And, you know, they have about 2 million under uh, harsh conditions in about 365 kilometers square, uh, the biggest prison in the world. But here in the West Bank, because it's much bigger, it's about 18% uh, of historical Palestine, while Gaza is only about 3%. You could see that what they are trying to create here is, is Bantu stamps. These are, it's even worse than Bantu stamps. You know, South Africans and experts will look at this and say this is even much worse than any, any idea the apartheid regime in South Africa was contemplating for its black uh, populations. Here you have these white areas, isolated areas, big prisons for Palestinians, <coughs> where settlers and Israeli military roam around all these green areas. So that is what is being contemplated for uh, Palestinians. And of course, these are, these, I'm sorry, these are settlements. I mean, the pa Palestinians are the others. Here it is, this is much wider. And you could see that uh, all, you know, in a big one, they try to, uh, this settlement, they have it here, this settlement, they have it there. So what it happens, it, it divides up uh, the, the Palestinian communities, it takes most of their lands, and then it connects them through bridges and tunnels. Uh, and it's an unbelievable way of, of, of handling it, of handling uh, that many population, which is the colonialist, the settler colonialist uh, mind. 
uh, the, uh, the the white ones I want to repeat is the ones that they are contemplating now in trying to annex uh, the full amount here and many of these settlements and with their connection to the 1948 period. The fifth strategic imperative is creating a garrison state. Ever since its establishment, Israel created a military-based society where it's a strategic imperative that security and survival are paramount and where most crucial decisions are based on military measures and they take precedence over all else. The military budget of the government of Israel per capita is the highest in the world by far. In Israeli society, the military is supreme. Out of six and a half million Jews, about half have either served or considered fit to serve in the military, with over 650,000 are either in active duty or in the reserve. It's, it's a military society with all what that term means. Uh, it's not a natural society. Everything, everybody is being militarized in their mind, in their action, in, their, in, in the way they, they have been conditioned, in the way they are taught in schools, in the way they are trained in the army, in the way they deal with others. Uh, uh, this, is, this is unnatural. This is a destruction of Jewish minds, in fact. Strategic Imperative 6 is to develop the military doctrine, <coughs> which says that overwhelming forces must be used in order to win against any and all enemies. And you do that by maintaining military technological edge over all rivals. So they need to keep that because they think the Israeli strategic thinker, the, the military strategist in Israel, the politicians, they think that they cannot lose once. The Arabs, the Palestinians, others, they could lose all the time. All what they have to do is to win once, and they can break that state. That's how they think. But we have to win every and each one, and we have to show overwhelming force to do that because of other considerations, not just numbers, but also strategic depth and so on and so forth. So what you have here is this, this zero-sum game, this zero-sum uh, uh, thinking that we have to be the strongest, we have to be the toughest, we have to have all kinds of military, uh, we have to use them if need be, and we have to be ruthless and brutal, because otherwise we cannot show that overwhelming force. So that's how, <clears throat> how this has developed over the time. So in their mind, they must win all wars against all enemies individually or combined. And if that doesn't happen, then they try to reach other means, other because the last thing they want, obviously, is to be uh, uh, defeated. Uh, they must fight on enemy territories. That's why they always go after people. They don't wait for others to come because they think that would be uh, uh, a defensive war for them is, is unconscionable. They, they have to always have the initiative of surprise and also to, to, to fight on other people's territories. Uh, they use overwhelming forces to deter enemy and employ all means. And they do not fight long wars because of its devastating effect on the economy. Since most of its soldiers are on reserve, once they, they go to, to the army, that means that the whole country uh, would, would, uh, um, would stop functioning uh, economically. And that has devastating uh, uh, impact on the economic life and social life uh, of the society. The uh, seventh strategic imperative is to maintain monopoly over nuclear weapons. And this came very early on in the 50s, actually. <clears throat> Israel, after the uh, initiation of nuclear weapons towards the end of uh, first, the Second uh, World War by the United States and followed by uh, Soviet Union in 49, and then a few other countries, Britain and England, <coughs> Israel started thinking that we need the ultimate weapon because this would be our trump card. This would be the, the, uh, the card that we, we, we could use or at least threaten with at the very end so that we can maintain our survival. So they, they started that program uh, back in the 50s and it progressed and they did all kinds of things and there are many, many books and resources that people could consult to find out how that developed. One of them is uh, the Samson Option by uh, Simon uh, Hirsch in which he insinuates uh, in that book, and it's very interesting, that uh, uh, John Kennedy, the president, 
elected in 61 and assassinated in 63, insinuates and, and actually he brings some evidence that Kennedy was intent on stopping the proliferation of, of nuclear weapons and he suspected that Israel was trying to de to to, uh, to develop one and he was he would have been insisted on stopping that program in exchange for the defense of Israel and of course he was assassinated and they were very uh, 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 I think they were very appreciative of the fact that they never had to uh, uh, be subjected to this to this to this pressure by an American uh, administration uh, so uh, so that's that's an interesting point so what they do is now they possess about 200 to 400 this is not a secret anymore it's it's pretty much open to everybody that they possess all these nuclear weapons which if used it will it will devastate the region no, no doubt uh, and it cannot be used <coughs> it's, 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 like, it's it's indeed the Samson option because that means if, if one of them is, is, is used, it has to have a direct impact on it. So it's really, it is not a real weapon to be used. It's more like a show because at the end for them to use it, that would be the, the total suicide, not only of, 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 the, uh, of their enemies, but also of themselves. The, Israel is one of very, very, very few uh, uh, countries or nations that haven't signed the NPT treaty, the non-proliferation treaty. Uh, and that's that's uh, that shows how much we live in a world of double standards. Uh, <clears throat> uh, all the nuclear weapon countries don't. And and uh, of course, Israel never declared itself to be a nuclear weapon or nuclear uh, 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 state. Uh, and therefore, uh, it, it's still being, and, and they're supposed, if those who do not sign, they're supposed to be punished, sanctioned, and yet Israel gets a free call, uh, mainly because of its relationship with, with the United States. Uh, it bombed Iraq's nuclear facilities in 81 because it was afraid that somehow Iraq may possess, and <coughs> it would not allow that, even though it has hundreds of nuclear weapons. It even, uh, there is much evidence now that it has contemplated bombing Pakistan's nuclear facilities. Pakistan is thousands and thousands of miles or kilometers from Israel, yet uh, it showed that Pakistan, because of its strong stance on Palestine, that it could, it may pose a threat to it in the future by aiding others and giving them the, the nuclear blanket by which the, the use of the nuclear weapon by Israel uh, could be uh, neutralized. And they contemplated actually bombing that, but of course, because of many, many reasons, including distance, they didn't have the, the refueling ability at the time, uh, they were not able to do that until uh, Pakistan declared itself a nuclear state in the late 90s. They bombed actually serious nuclear facilities back in 2007, <coughs> and now you could see the obsession over Iran's nuclear web program, in which the whole world has been mobilized particularly the American administration, in order to sanction, isolate, and suffocate Iran because of the Israeli fear that uh, Israel, the Iran's nuclear program may develop, even though after all the checks and balances that have been put into the system uh, by uh, the uh, agreement of 2015. The eighth strategic imperative is to build the most efficient, sophisticated, and ruthless security apparatus and intelligence operations needed to control the populations in the territories, eliminate threats, and manipulate regional politics. As I said, Israel, <coughs> yes, it is a garrison state, military is supreme, but also it has other agencies, apparatuses, uh, uh, operations, uh, the, the Shabak, the Amman, the Mossad, and other you know, the, the, the Sariyat Mithal and all these agencies where they have been uh, mobilized in order to neutralize using all means, including illegal means throughout the world in order to maintain this, not even to, to maintain this uh, uh, um, edge, but not only that, but we could see also that we have perhaps as much as 150,000 agents within the, uh, the West Bank who are dealing with Palestinians. Now, these are people who are controlling every aspect of the Palestinian life, and frankly, every aspect of Palestinian life beyond the West Bank in which they can have the control over. 
And uh, this is how they see that they can function and survive by, by building these intelligent services and by using all illegal means in order to, uh, to neutralize their enemies. And in his book, uh, Bergman, in which he talked about the, uh, the, uh, the history of, uh, of, of assassinations, not only by the Mossad, but by all these different agencies, he cites not hundreds, but thousands, thousands of Palestinians uh, from scientists and, and Arabs and, and, and Muslims and, and non-Muslims for that matter. Anybody that they perceived as a threat, he was neutralized anywhere in the world. They think that they can have access and they have immunity any part of the world. We have seen it throughout the years, how they go from capital to capital, state from state, doesn't matter which continent, which country, where it is, they are willing to go and kill and neutralize and use all illegal means to do uh, that. This is, this, is, this is the pure definition of a terrorist state. But that's how they act. This is how they think they can survive by building these uh, terror organizations that roam the world in order to uh, <coughs> wreak havoc on their enemies and control people's lives. <coughs> Strategic Imperative 9 is linking tightly, and that's very important, and that's been from the very beginning. You know, in the Quran we read, Hablun Allah, Hablun Min al This is this is a rope from the people. This is that they can, Israel cannot live without having a tight relationship with an international power and benefactor. Even if they have to serve as a client state, which it was at many junctures of its history during the Cold War and others. You know, at the beginning it was the United Kingdom who was under British mandate between 1918 and 1948. Then it briefly was under the, the tutelage of Russia and Czechoslovakia and Germany. That's where they got their arms. That's where they got their money from Germany, from the compensation payments for the Holocaust uh, survivors. And then during the 50s and 60s, uh, before the goal under France, <coughs> where they got their nuclear nuclear um, technology and they got uh, the, 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 the Air Force and other weapons. And of course, since the 1973, this is the only war, by the way, that the Arabs initiated because they were trying to get something of what they had lost in 1967, which meant that they have to do something. And they were, uh, especially Sadat at the time, he was propelled by Kissinger that uh, at, at, the, at, at the time, the balance of, of, of forces, the balance of power did not favor any kind of concession or compromise. So Sadat so kicked out the Soviet expert, initiated a limited war in which actually they, they uh, did not achieve their objectives. And actually at the end, it was uh, more a seizure of land by Israel on the, east, uh, on the, on the western side of the canal. Uh, at the end, uh, since that time, when Nixon decided to be the strategic partner to Israel, uh, from that point on, is, uh, the United States became the main benefactor, patron of the state of Israel. I had, uh, as Gerard said, I had written a paper on this, in which I go through all the different presidents and all the different vetoes and all the different uh, financial aid and so on and so forth that has taken place. It's, uh, it's unprecedented in history, and it just shows the depth of that relationship, which is based on not only the, the power of the Jewish lobby or the Israeli lobby in the United States, but also how the United States perceives its strategic interests uh, in the region. <clears throat> and to show that this was very early on, here's a quote from Theodore Hilzer in which he says, I believe it would be a good thing for our cause if the English were forced to leave Egypt. This is very early on, in the late 1800s. They would then be obliged to seek out another road to India in place of the Suez Canal. So he basically said that we could be your client state, which would be lost to them or at least rendered insecure. In that event, a modern Jewish Palestine with a railroad from Jaffa to the Persian Gulf would resolve their difficulty. We can be your client state. We could see also another uh, quotation by the first president who was also British. Uh, this is a quotation from Hayim Wiseman. Hayim Wiseman was, of course, a, a, uh, uh, he became a British, and he was the first president, and also at, at, the, at one time he was the president of the World Jewish Congress. We'd long pointed out to the British, and I repeat it again <coughs> in my interview 
with Lord Cecil, you know, the, the, uh, the settler colonials, that a Jewish Palestine would be a safeguard to England, in particular in respect to the Suez Canal. Our foresight had larger bearings than we ourselves understood. It's proper to ask, after this interval of a quarter of a century with the Second World War fresh in our memories, this is right after, what the position would have been in the Near East, meaning in the Middle East, not for England alone, but for the world, democratic cause, if we had not provided in Palestine a foothold, a foothold for England. So this is, there is, there is a design here about the whole region, that this region cannot stay united, cannot stay as it has been in history, that there has to be a foothold for, for colonialism, for imperialist powers, for great powers in the area, and Israel would serve that purpose. That's the, what the founders of Zionism were contemplating. And here is uh, a former Israeli Deputy National Security Advisor, who's also an American citizen, by the way, that's Charles uh, Frelick. He says, Israel's relationship with the U.S. is a fundamental pillar of its national security, military, diplomatically, and economically. American support has for decades been a vital, strategic, and he used that word, which, which I was very surprised, strategic enabler. The, he, here he is showing a function of Israel that helps American policy. In other words, Israel does America's dirty work. That's what is meant, I believe, with this statement. That's what it chose. The tenth strategic imperative is to keep world Jewry. Now remember, Jews number perhaps as much as 15 million around the world. They are the strategic depth of Israel. I don't think any other Jew would actually emigrate anymore. We have all uh, the Jews who wanted to emigrate and therefore they want to make sure that they have that supply, that mobilization effort those funding opportunities, that <coughs> ability to mobilize the whole world for their cause. So part of that is to keep world jewelry, especially in Western countries, the US and Europe. Zionists, with unquestionable support for Israel, that's why they have their own institutions and ministries and programs in which they try to mobilize world Jews, especially the youth, who are turning away from this notion of uh, uh, Israel being a, a an apartheid state. So we can find that. We also find these great efforts, and there is no time to go over it, the lobbying efforts, the media networks, the funding, and so on and so forth. But that's, that's a very important strategic uh, imperative. If this weakens, that weakens the ability of the state to survive and function. The strategic imperative number 11 is to keep the enemy as they define it divided and weak. And to do that, they have to fragment the Middle East and beyond. So in, in Palestine, they want to keep the Palestinians divided. So we call Gaza, West Bank, Jerusalem, diaspora. So we cannot think of the Palestinians as one people. So they go in and isolate Gaza and, and, and they, they, they were not going to make sure that we get a united front. So they, they insist not having any kind of meaningful unity among the West Bank and Gaza. The West Bank is totally controlled by the security apparatus and the security coordination taking place today between the Palestinians, uh, the Palestinian security forces within the Palestinian Authority and the Israelis. Jerusalem has been totally isolated for decades, the diaspora and so on and so forth. For the, you know, there was another strategic plan that came back in 1982. It's called the Audit Union Plan. And what's you know, people ask me sometimes, why is this important? It's important because this person was the strategic uh, uh, advisor of Sharon. Sharon was prime minister. Prime Minister Sharon, who died back in, two, uh, who uh, uh, was the prime minister of Israel uh, in the early 2000, uh, after the um, second intifada, and then he, uh, he died, or at least had brain damage in office and then died later. But he adopted this plan how do I know this? Because I translated a speech for him back in 1983 after he was dismissed as a defense minister in the, after, in the aftermath of the uh, Sabra and, Ch and Chatila massacres in which he gave a speech to NATO in, I think it was July, in the summer of 1983, in which he talked about, he, I called it, I don't know what he called it, uh, we called that booklet that we, we produced and distributed the new map of the Middle East. But it was based on this audit union plan that seeks to fragment the Middle East because he says in his plan, 
which was translated, by the way, by uh, Professor <coughs> Israel Shahat in 1998 into English, because this was written in Hebrew. <coughs> he said <coughs> that uh, what we need to do in order for Israel to be the hegemon of the area, we must fragment the Middle East. We must divide it up. Iraq must be three states. Syria must be at least two states. Saudi Arabia, three states. And then every other state must be fragmented. And that's how we can uh, survive in order to maintain hegemony and ensure survival. Israel must be the strongest state in the area to become the regional hegemon in the uh, words of John Mearsheimer. Because of demographics and other reasons to become the regional hegemon, all other states must be broken up and fragmented on the basis of ethnic and sectarian lines. Of course, uh, this, uh, these are some of the uh, plans that were looked at in which uh, how Israel uh, would, would, would make sure that we have these different uh, ethnicities in independent nations, Saudi Arabia, Hejaz, and Western Arabia, Wahhabism, and so on and so forth. Of course, these are just uh, uh, dreams, but that's, that's, that's a goal that this is the only way we can maintain and you could see that uh, these are uh, other other uh, plans and 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 do we have any uh, examples i will show some examples but to become regional regional hegemon you have to ally yourself by my with minorities separatists despots and tyrants so that's the goal but there's another strategic imperative which is which is the, this is the last one it is that in order to get to that state of being the ruler, the hegemon, the most powerful state in the region, I have to align myself myself with minorities, separatists, despots, tyrants. That's why in the in the aftermath of the Arab Spring, Israel was horrified, was terrified of the potential of the Arab masses if they become independent again, if you have democratic governors again, in which people will, will take the matter into their hands, that Israel's survival would be only a matter of time. So they allied themselves with the counter-revolutionary uh, forces in the whole region in order to overturn this moment, this exceptional moment in history where uh, tyrannical regimes were overturned. So we could see that they always fight popular, independent, and democratic movements all around there and their uh, <coughs> and their supporters, from Nasser and the United Arab Republic back in the 50s and 60s, to the Shah of Iran, they allied themselves with the Shah of Iran, uh, to the Maronites in, in Lebanon in the 80s, uh, or against the Arab Spring movements uh, after 2011. Uh, take the example of Kurdish. Uh, this is... <coughs> Because of the nation-state uh, concept and the, the design of the imperialist and colonialist, uh, they did not offer the Kurds a state. There's a lot of grievances that must be acknowledged about the Kurdish uh, uh, people throughout. Their lands were divided into four different nations, Syria, Iran, Iraq, and Turkey. Yet, any change of this balance now is going to actually destabilize many of these countries. But Israel is keen on destabilizing the area. So they have been uh, aiding Kurdish separatists ever since the 1950s when they called for the, uh, uh, the referendum a few years ago. It was Israel the only country in the world. And actually they acknowledge because they have a very active Mossad presence in the Kurdish, in the Iraqi Kurdish areas, and they're trying to force this in world governments as well as on others, but because of different geopolitical reasons and alliances, uh, this, this, this was not successful. But they have been trying to that. That's not for the lack of trying. They have been trying very, very hard to do that because in their strategic mind, if we have a Kurd, this would be a barrier. This would be a buffer <coughs> state that where we can have real influence. They did the same <coughs> with Sudan. Since the 50s, Israel's Mossad had agents working in southern Sudan trying to separate South Sudan from Sudan, and they never tired. When the uh, current president of, the, of South Sudan visited Israel, next to him there was a person who appeared to be Israeli, and he said in one of his speeches, uh, if it wasn't for this man, we would never have gained independence, we would never have had South Sudan. That person was the chief of the Israeli Mossad station in South Sudan. They worked tirelessly in order to split Sudan. And of course, because of many mistakes, 
uh, in Khartoum and others that came to war, but they only, they, now they want to even split Sudan further into Darfur, Sudan, and South Sudan. That's an ongoing process. Here's another example. When they invaded Lebanon in 78, <coughs> and then later in 82, they established what they call a buffer zone, a security zone, where they had their own Maronite militia, the militia of Saad Haddad, the South Lebanese army. They're trying to establish a friendly government. They fail, and because of the resistance, the resistance of Hezbollah and others, they came to had to evacuate because of the many casualties they were taking. But that was the plan. The plan is to go 40 kilometers and create this buffer zone and, and empower minorities. They look at the Muslim world and they see where the fault, the huge fault lines are. And of course, one of these fault lines are Sunni Shia divide, the religious ethnicities, uh, the, the religious uh, uh, sectarian uh, differences, as well as the, ethnic, the ethnic differences. They try to exploit that and empower groups that can take that to the next step by fueling divisions and by fueling conflicts uh, throughout the Arab world and beyond. Now, what are the end of conflict scenarios? Israel actually for many years, it's, it's moot, this point is moot now, they had the choice of uh, picking two out of these three, being Jewish as they demand, which is Zionist imperative, uh, taking the land completely, which is another Zionist imperative, and democracy, which not really a Zionist imperative, but it is something that is nice for PR reasons. And for many reasons, for many years, is, uh, Israel would claim that it is the only democracy in the, in, the, in, the, in the Arab world. It's the only democracy in the Middle East. It's the only democracy, uh, but of course it's a Jewish democracy. It has nothing to do with, with uh, uh, giving dem democratic uh, rights to anybody. It's like, it's like South Africans uh, under apartheid coming and saying, we are full democracy, or the United States uh, under slavery. We are full democracy. Of course they are not. When they deny their, you know, a, 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 a vast majority of their citizens the ability to uh, to, to function as human beings or have any kind of political and human rights. So if they have chosen Jewish and democracy, that would have ended two states, which is the, the illusion that the world has been living under since 93 in the Oslo process, that Israel had no intention whatsoever to, uh, to implement. And we know that now for, for a fact. Or land and democracy in which we end up with one state. Forget about being Jewish. You have all these people. <coughs> Then you have one state, which many people now are calling for, or, and that's not, of course, that Israel <coughs> Zionism would never agree to that because it's one of their pillars. The first pillar, the first principle, the first strategic imperative is to stay Jewish because of this racist uh, mindset, or to have Jewish and land, and that's what they insist on, which will end up in an apartheid. So how do we confront apartheid? If this is what we live under. Well, <clears throat> we I have laid out to you eight, 12 principles. Now, a lot of these principles are what the Israel is using to maintain its survival, existence, and presence. If some of these strategic imperatives become inoperable, that will weaken the state until it comes to the point that it will break up the same way that the state, uh, 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 the apartheid state of South Africa broke up eventually under this tremendous pressure. So we need to look back at these 12 and see how we can strengthen the, 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 the struggle against this by making some of these or most of them unoperable. We change or perhaps a change of international power structure where it will demand, and of course we can see that there is no will, especially with today's were great powers that they really have absolutely no uh, will and, and and no inclination and also uh, from their point perhaps even no interest in seeing this even though it's, it's very volatile or a change of regional power structure like we saw briefly in 2012 2013 which of course it was never allowed to survive or a crumbling internal dynamics due to inherent weaknesses in Israeli society. And today we see it very clearly. The Arab versus Jew, the religious versus secular, the rich versus poor, the Ashkenazi versus Mizrahi, the urban versus the settler, the older versus the old versus young. So all these are many dynamics which seems to me weakening 
Israeli society, and I think eventually it will uh, catch up with, 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 with how Israelis uh, view themselves. I had a friend, an Israeli friend, who was telling me that he did not uh, want to go to the army, so he faked, uh, when he was interviewed, he faked it, and they said, okay, you're exempt, and I said, did they believe you? He said, no, they didn't believe me, but they didn't want to send someone who was not willing to fight. And I said, is this happening open? He said, more often than you can think. His whole, all his brothers and sisters have basically adopted the same and all of them got away <coughs> from serving. If this trend continues, where Israel, you know, we're talking about a different generation, where one of the pillars and imperatives also would be weakened and uh, 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 severely. And of course, by having a worldwide solidarity movement to end Israeli apartheid, which is taking place as we speak, and it's widening uh, by the day. Uh, here's an example, for example, but this, this is where people can, can actually uh, um, work on. Uh, on the left-hand side, I'm sorry, this is not in English. On the left-hand side, we have Israeli uh, imports, and on the right-hand side, we have Israeli exports. This is just to uh, Arab and Muslim countries. And it's amazing how you could see that uh, one of the countries that has the, the most uh, trade with Israel, and this, of course, this is historically, so I'm not going to uh, criticize what's taking place. This is in 2017. It's Turkey. The Turkey uh, uh, imports from Israel almost 2.9 billion. This was as of uh, three years ago. And uh, uh, it, it, sorry, it, it exports to Israel about 2.9 billion. So it has a net uh, plus. And Israel uh, <coughs> imports about, or exports rather, about 1.4 billion, so that's that's a huge. The second country is about 200 million, and you know, very, very, very simple. But almost uh, the the overwhelming uh, majority comes comes from Turkey. So this is this is where place where 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 uh, uh, Turkish citizens and, and activists can actually work in order to isolate Israel, that is insisting on Judaizing the the Aqsa Mosque and taking over Jerusalem and and, and exiling the Palestinians and torturing them and putting them in big prisons, and, and all these violations, uh, and yet uh, we have this, this trade that's going on. Now, let me conclude. So the end goal is to dismantle, as I, I started my talk, we have a Zionist project, we have a system, we have imperatives. Uh, we cannot live with the Zionist project. I mean, yesterday, Elan Pape gave full explanation why Zionist has a zero-sum game. They cannot live, they cannot compromise. There is no compromise here, and and it's 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 uh, it's really not fair, not just to the Palestinians but to the Jews also, to have a Zionist state in charge of them. This is this is a, a grievous crime against not just Palestinians and victims of Zionism but also against the Jews. So the end goal should really to end this racist, exclusivist Zionist project in Palestine, its system and its ugly institutions. We need to have a worldwide solidarity movement to support justice and to restore full rights for the Palestinians, who are the primary victims of Zionism. Often people talk about Israeli victimhood, which I, I acknowledge at the beginning of my talk about what happened to them during pogroms and, and, and the Holocaust and other massacres throughout history. But that is no excuse whatsoever to go and turn into victimized. By, vic by, victimize, by victimizing Palestinians because they simply live in a land that Jews, Zionists have coveted. We need to save Judaism from Zionism. This is very important. To me, this is very important. This is part of my faith, is that we should never allow Judaism to be a, a vehicle uh, to distort what it means to be a one of the great religions of the world, of manifestations of God's work. This this could not this should not happen. So this whole thing about anti Semitism and, and equating Judaism with Zionism should totally be rejected. That is not the case at all. Uh, Jews do not have just to live in the state of Palestine. We as Arabs, Muslims throughout the world should allow them to go and live anywhere they want. They should save they should feel safe as Jews and safe as practicing Jews. And uh, they are welcome. And we have the historical experience to show it. That they, they went through all uh, countries and cities and towns <coughs> and they were living in peace and harmony. 
I went to Edirne a few years ago and saw the restoration of the synagogue there by the Turkish government. It was unbelievable. Uh, 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 and it was totally at the cost of the uh, Turkish government. Uh, the people across the Muslim world, the Arab world, uh, their hearts are with Palestine. With every Arab revolution, whenever people were allowed to express their aspirations and support and 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 um, uh, uh, a bright future, they always had a Palestinian flag <coughs> along with their own flag. This is Tunisia, for example. This is in Egypt. <coughs> this is Libya. This is Syria. <coughs> this is Bahrain. This is Morocco. This is Lebanon. This is Iraq. This is Iran. Algeria. Pakistan. Malaysia. Afghanistan. Chile. London. New York. All Palestine under Palestinian sovereignty. This is rabbis in New York that reject Zionism because it distorts their concept of their faith. South Africa, where Nelson Mandela said, we know too well that our freedom is incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinians. Turkey, and the great march of return, of return, millions of Palestinians waiting patiently to go back to their countries. Thank you very much and I'm happy to take your questions. Uh, thank you, Professor, for, for this interesting lecture, uh, uh, which came with uh, the 72nd of the Nakba, the establishment of the Zionist States. Uh, I'm sorry if we take a little bit more time, but uh, we, can, we, can, we can extend because I... Uh, uh, okay. so, yes. Before I open the floor for Q&A, uh, just let's, let me ask this following big question uh, after 72 uh, year of uh, years of uh, the establishment of israel the zionist state uh, what has changed in this in this struggle uh, i mean in terms of uh, of the nature of this struggle uh, the the means and parties of this struggle and uh, in general the, the geopolitical context of this struggle uh, i mean uh, what are the the, the stable variables here in this struggle and what uh, and the changing factors you really has hit on on my the essence of my lecture because i'm arguing here is that these are the imperatives that the zionists always had in mind they did not operate all of them at once because it was not uh, uh, it was not easy for them to do so i mean th things could not have been at that time because of their relative weaknesses. So they had to build one after the other, but never fulfilling the original uh, uh, imperatives or principles. So what has changed is that Israel was not at its peak when it started, and the Arabs also were relatively much, much weaker. But they also, there was a lot of, uh, how should I put it? There was a lot of misinformation as, as well as a lot of uh, ignorance about the nature of what this movement is trying to achieve. Uh, many international powers uh, actually uh, aided them without seeing how far this would take and how destructive it would be, not only on the region but on on the world. And I think the uh, the uh, the awareness of 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 the mass awareness of mankind was not the same as it is. Uh, today, so there are some weak points and obviously uh, strong points, but on the on the issue of the Zionist power, it certainly it is at, uh, at 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 the height of its power, but also at the height of its vulnerability. But I think it even will go will become more vulnerable. So that affords us opportunities to attack it with at its weak points because of its destructive nature. No, no okay. Uh, I have another question, but let me. Uh uh, ask it uh, at the end of this lecture. Uh, now we have many questions here, uh, and let me take it one by one. If you, if it is okay. Uh, so the first question asks about uh, uh, the arguments that Jewish people and their Muslim rulers 
in the Middle Age were still bad and second-class citizens, but not as uh, treatable as Christian rulers. Uh, what is your opon opinion about that? Well, <clears throat> I would refer the person. Of course, everything has to be put in context, because in, yes. in Islam, as well as during the Ottoman Empire, you know, the actual practice, they use the millet system. And in the millet system, uh, you have different communities where they can apply their own laws. That the, the laws of the majority would not have to be uh, applied to them. Now, to, in today's nation state system, that looks absurd. That this is not a, a, an equitable uh, or a just society. But in the context of that, you know, a lot of Jews, they, they, they very much like to, to, to use their own laws in trying to administer their own affairs, <coughs> except where <coughs> the affairs are <coughs> the common affairs. <coughs> Excuse me. So, uh, but I, I, again, I would refer you, refer you to many books by Jewish scholars. Bernard Lewis is one of them, and Bernard Lewis is no friend of Islam or Muslims. You should know that, you know, up front. But he has this book about the Jews of Islam in which he argues in chapter after chapter how Jews actually, the only reason that Jew, the Jewish communities survive today is probably because of Islam. If, 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 Muslim, if Islam did not exist, it is very doubtful that Jews would have survived uh, uh, today, that Christians would have killed them and massacred them. And whatever Jews uh, existed in, in European communities, certainly uh, those Jews do not necessarily, and there's a lot of debate about that even within Jewish circles, the, the, because the Sephardic Jews are the Jews who were of the area, of the communities. And those are the ones who actually developed all the different rabbinic uh, laws and rules and so on and so forth, uh, where most of the European Jews came from a tribe, which is called sometimes the 13th tribe. And of course, many uh, Jewish uh, rabbis would, would, would take issue with that, but that's that's also been documented. So the point is that the, the reason we have uh, uh, blossoming Jewish culture and Jewish music and Jewish philosophy and Jewish law uh, and, and it is because of their presence within the, the Muslim culture. Okay, here we have another uh, question about uh, the, the, the United States and Israel uh, relationships. Uh, and they said what, uh, what may be an issue that would make the United States cross it off protecting Israel from the United States objective interest in the Middle East? Very good question, and it will take really yes. <laughs> To, to do this. So it's very unfair for me to give an answer in, in one minute or, or less. But the bottom line is that there are two schools on this. And I believe that uh, each school is partially correct. There isn't one answer to this. One, of course, is the, and, and we have uh, Professor Mirsheimer and Stephen Wolf, both of them subscribed to the school and they wrote a whole book called The, Jew the Israel Lobby, which was a bestseller and also a lot of people uh, attacked them for it. And he gives uh, many of the U.S. policies in the Middle East due to the pressure that the Israeli lobby, the different interests that defend Israel's interest in the U.S., not just a lobby, not just an organization, it's not an organization. A lobby, an Israeli or pro-Israeli lobby, is not one organization sitting in Washington. It's a multitude of organizations. They come together through networks. And there's a whole book that came in 1995 called Jewish Power by J.J. Goldberg, in which he explains, and of course that book needs to, to, to be updated, there are many other books as well, but that particular book, they gives a panorama, a view, a description of all these organizations that function as Israel's backbone and power uh, across the United States, in media, in culture, in business, uh, in politics, in education, in universities, academia, and so on and so forth. You have a whole community that is empowering <coughs> Israel to have a, a, a strong a stranglehold uh, on, on, on American politics. And that didn't come didn't come over overnight. I mean, APAC started in 53, but its first legislative success was in the 70s. And it became more prominent after it started defeating candidates, primarily Charles Percy in Illinois and, and um, uh, uh, other people, you know, who were senators and Congress people. Uh, and, and, and they were able to do that because they were able to mobilize whatever resources they had to make example from some others. So they were able to, to, to push and support some candidates and bring some candidates uh, down. But 
the point is, this, this is one one view, and I think it is it is uh, it's a fact. I mean, you cannot deny. But it is not the only fact. There is another fact also that uh, the United States has strategic interests, and these strategic interests are being protected primarily <coughs> by the Pentagon, Defense Department, and other uh, uh, strategic thinkers, national security professionals, and military industry complex, and so on and so forth. And these interests also uh, are, are serving and working hand and glove with the Israeli interests. And for, for whatever reason, Israel is seen by them as being a strategic asset that they could use to further their interests. So the whole concept of an American empire and American colonialist project throughout, they don't see it that way, that's my description, or is, is to have these client states that they can depend on at times of crisis. So when they define enemies, they need allies. These allies can help them in overcoming their enemies. And so sometimes they would subcontract, they would give certain tasks to certain client states to do their uh, uh, dirty work, their, their dirty linen. All right, so that they cannot be excused, uh, uh, accused of that. Nixon did it when he basically outsourced the protection of the Middle East to Israel and the West side and Iran during the Shah on the Eastern side. So there is an aspect to this, an aspect to that. And of course, this particular uh, theory is subscribed by Noam Chomsky and, and some others. So, and I think there's truth to both. And I, I might have to uh, give another talk to talk uh, uh, in details about uh, each one and uh, and the evidence that supports each one. Yeah, inshallah, uh, 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 the same uh, context. This maybe this is the the interest or the the, the dimension of interest, uh, national interest. But there is another dimension here. I have another question: the the religion dimension, the evangel. Uh, ev evangelical, yeah, Christians, uh, and now the relation with the, the right wing uh, Israelis. Now, do you think that this is a very deep and interesting dimension to explain this kind of relationships? Well, this is a very important point. Unfortunately, I didn't have time, but it comes from also building these alliances outside. So, uh, what we see today uh, in the U.S. interest, not only. Uh, Jewish Zionists, but even more importantly, and this has been going on uh, on the rise since the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980, uh, but in now it's even becoming uh, uh, more uh, um, apparent and, and clearer, is that the Christian Zionists are pushing the political establishment, particularly with the Trump administration, because their worldview is they are obsessed with the notion that Jesus is coming down and because that's how you can have salvation and they don't care about Jews one bit one centella all what they care about is Israel because they think Israel is the uh, uh, the sign for the 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 uh, uh, the coming uh, the, 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 the end of times the coming of Jesus Christ and therefore, they want to support Israel to hasten this particular event, you know, the rupture and, and the descendants of Jesus, and, and that's how they can go to heaven. Because of their influence, because of their power, uh, political power and evangelical power, because they can reach perhaps as many as 70 million people, because of the vast amount of money raising that they can do to political campaigns, uh, because of that alliance, and because, frankly, because some people exploit them. There are many of these pastors who are fake pastors. They exploit those simple believers, telling them that they're going to go to heaven in order to get millions and millions of dollars to enrich themselves. And I'm not making this up. You can, there's, there's plenty of literature that exposes these people. So the point here is that evangelical Christianity has become an extremely dangerous player where we or people in the, in the Muslim world, in the Arab world, in Palestine, do not feel them directly, but they are part and parcel of the equation now. And Israeli interests and Israeli uh, operative, operatives have been working with them very, very closely in order to uh, use that power to leverage it over successive uh, administrations. We could see that, for example, within the uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the transfer of, 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 or the declaration of Jerusalem. Uh, we can see it, uh, see it also in terms of the uh, different plans 
uh, when when I saw uh, when Trump was talking in the uh, in the uh, East Room about when he in uh, when he was explaining his his uh, the state of the century when he was telling his uh, his plan, uh, I could see many many evangelicals were in the room. There were more Christian and Jewish Zionists in the room than anyone else. All of them basically they were harder than anybody else. Yeah. Uh, here, let's be combined two questions. Uh, many many scholars uh, give uh, give importance to the foreign policy and this kind of uh, big issues. But uh, there is a question here about the, the domestic problem in Israel. Very interesting, I think, the demographic problem. Do you think is very deep a problem in Israel and uh, the future of this country? The demographic uh, problem. Certainly, it's a problem, but it's not insurmountable. In other words, they can deal with it. Because roughly now it's about 50 50. Palestinians are slightly more, but they can, they know, they figured out for after years and years of experience, they hone that experience. They know how to control Palestinian lives. They separated them. Uh, Palestinians live in, in neighborhoods, in Bantu stands. So it's very easy. And then you have a pliable, a compliant uh, political <coughs> leadership in which they can control many through them. They have a security coordination in which they know everything they think, they know everything about every Palestinian uh, uh, since the day they are born, and they have very efficient security apparatus. As long as they have this, they can control Palestinians. So the demographic will not play a role until it becomes really unmanageable. That is not uh, gonna happen in the next uh, few years. And in the back of their minds, they think that if there's a catastrophe, a catastrophe or a big event, hopefully not the current coronavirus pandemic, that they maybe they can they can push more Palestinians outside in order to empty the land and fulfill the Zionist project of having all of historical Palestine to the Jews only. But I don't think that in today's world that this will easily pass. This will be very, very, very difficult if impossible to implement. Now we have a question about a regional question. If I can say the, the how the Arabs and Muslim states uh, supporters of Israel justify their uh, their support, well, why they justify? Yeah, <coughs> what are the reasons behind them? Many Arab regimes, all what they think about, especially those who are tyrannical, you know, they are oppressive, uh, they are not elected, they are not democratic. Uh, all what they care about is to stay in power. Somehow. It's in uh, somebody put in their head, or maybe that's how they think, is that the only way to do that, we have to be strong allies of the strongest country in the region in the world. That is the United States. And for us to be on good terms with the United States, maybe they thought that when Obama gave up uh, Hosni Mubarak uh, one day before he abdicated, uh, before he, he uh, uh, left power, uh, is that we don't want to reach that stage where Obama can say it's time to go. So we need to make sure that we are on good terms with the U.S. We are in the in the best graces of the United States. And they think that the only way you can do that is through Israel. They are convinced that that is the way. So they said if we can, if Israel is, is pleased with us, if Israel likes us, they're going to go because they control, they, this is how they think, they control the U.S. and they control the White House Therefore, the White House will never give up on us and they will support us. We will never be uh, under any pressure to leave. We will be, we can do whatever we want to the opposition and we will never have to face the consequences because this world actually has somebody who's running it, who's managing it, and that is the United States. And if the United States is managing this world and it's not going to hold us accountable and <clears throat> the way to get to that stage is to be friends for Israel, then be it. So they are not necessarily a lover of Israel, but Israel to them is a means to a goal, to an end, and that end is to stay in power and to use whatever means to stay in power, including brutal means. You know, they can kill and and uh, and and, uh, and and slaughter and and cut off uh, an opposition uh, voice somewhere in somebody's embassy and get away with it. They can go and massacre thousands of people in the uh, in a square and get away with it. They can go and 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 simply kill tens of thousands in 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 a uh, using using whatever means uh, and they can get away with it so if that's the case and to do that you need to get 
uh, close to Israel, then that's the price they're willing to pay. <laughs> yes, it's logic. Uh, now I have another question. Uh, I think it's very interesting too. And how should Muslims across the globe uh, could be uh, publicity against Israeli Zionist policies without being accused uh, as a anti Zionism or anti Jewish? I think uh, Dr. Is, uh, yesterday answered this very eloquently. And I agree with him wholeheartedly. He says this question cannot be answered with yes or no. Uh, whoever asks this question, they have to be <clears throat> patient enough to give someone 10 or 15 minutes to explain the difference between Judaism, Zionism, and anti-Semitism. And unless we define these terms adequately and explain it to them, we cannot answer this question. So if someone does that, then we have to take them back to the origins of what Ju uh, Judaism is and what it entails and what how we define it, what is Zionism and what it entails and what it has done, and uh, what is anti-Semitism as practiced in many parts of the world that we totally condemn and we totally uh, 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 oppose without any conditions because uh, it's, 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 it's the faith of many in the Arab world and the Muslim world, if they are truly believers, to not to prosecute anybody, to persecute them, uh, excuse me, to persecute anybody based on their faith. That is just not, you know, no compulsion in religion, period. So anybody who's trying to claim otherwise, like Daesh and others, should totally be rejected. These are not people who understand their faith or practice it. But generally speaking, when we talk about uh, 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 the, the Islamic community, the best way is to go back to the history. The historical record shows that Jews were protected under uh, Muslims. Yes, maybe this is a serious problem for for, for people, for, for Palestinians or Arabs or Muslims who are living in the, in the Western countries. Right, but now, uh, and here I have another question related to, the, to this issue. Now we have uh, not Palestinians or Arabs or Muslims who live in Arab countries and Muslim countries and they cannot uh, show their uh, support for this uh, for these cases. Uh, for example, here someone asked about some Gulf states who support the right wing, uh, Israeli wings uh, with money, with, you know, uh, this kind how you how how do you how do you uh, see the future of the Palestinians there? Again, one of the most shameful acts that uh, uh, nation state governments uh, have have done <clears throat> is that now we no longer have these uh, notions of empathy, of sympathy, of support, of love, of brotherhood, of caring. Of, of seeing this as, 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 as one issue. These borders were created by colonialist powers. A scholar who was born in Andalusia can go all the way across North Africa and reach Palestine and, and stay there. No one's going to stop him. Or they can go and settle in Istanbul or die in Persia. Uh, that was a land open to everybody. Uh, in less than 100 years ago, this, this, we, 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 we lived like that for centuries. About 100 years ago, you know, after Sykes-Picot, when they start chopping off the Ottoman Empire and dividing us and creating these artificial borders. Now, if you go to uh, a, a country, uh, you are considered non-citizen simply because you did not exist or your ancestors didn't exist when this was drawn, when these lines were drawn. And that is not the only ramifications, but also you have to suffer, to suffer immensely, even though you probably contribute to the society more than any other member of that society. This nationalism, this uh, ethnocentrism, uh, we, we must purge it from our minds, from our souls, from our bodies, from our thinking. That's going to take generations to do, but that's the only way. And so most people look at Palestinians, uh, uh, you know, Palestinians are not asking to, uh, to get citizenships and enjoy the life and forget about their lands. That's never going to be the case. Palestinians want the opportunity to live in dignity where they are temporarily until they have the right, until they exercise their right to go back to their country and, uh, and the right of return is implemented. And that's going to take obviously time because of the, uh, of the balance of power now in the, in the region. 
So uh, what happens to the Palestinians in the Gulf, in Lebanon, in, in other places across the Arab world and, and, and beyond is, is unconscionable, is, is, it should be rejected and, and should be co uh, uh, completely reversed uh, because it, it's, it's against every uh, uh, belief system as well as every human rights. Yeah. Now, now I have I have question. It's my question, and uh, the regarding the geopolitics shift now. Uh, as you know, professor, the history of uh, of Zionism show us always Zionists uh, were were always uh, uh, covered themselves under a number of a great power, like you mentioned in your presentation before. Uh, they were covered. Uh, under the umbrella of uh, of the British Empire, um, and they use it this power, yeah. right? And yeah. then before I think, uh, if I remember well, the Baltimore Conference, uh, 1942, they mm -hmm. shifted to the United States That's because true. they yeah they 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 saw the the decline of this uh, uh, British Empire and the rise of a new empire the United States. So they shifted all the, the activities and, uh, and, uh, and the money and assets to the United States. Now we are living another shift in era uh, with the decline, the relative decline of the United States now as a great power uh, in the favor of another raising powers in the East, uh, maybe China, India, especially India here. Uh, and Russia. <coughs> now, do you think? Do you think we're gonna see a new shift uh, of Israeli movement uh, or Zionist movement toward this kind of great powers, or uh, there are like uh, a cultural or a religious barrier to uh, prevent this shifting? Very important question, and thank you for bringing it up because it puts it uh, in, in focus. Um, certainly. Uh, Israel is trying to ally itself by looking into the future and see who could be have the biggest influence or the bigger influence in uh, world affairs. And they have been uh, actually at, at, at the top of the curve at that level. So they have very early on established relationships with China even before its, its rise economically. I remember back in the 1980s, they were trying to get uh, <coughs> away from American sanctions that Reagan imposed on China by selling them military technology. And every time they were caught by the Americans, they would have to cancel and apologize. And they started that relationship very early, as I said, over 30, 40 years ago. So, or maybe 35 years ago. But now it's, it's even in the open. Uh, they have these strong ties, military ties and intelligence, intelligence ties and, and others. But of course, it's not the same. Because the main power of Israel in the United States is not just its strategic position and the uh, uh, decision or the will of the United States to use it as a client state, but because also of the presence of almost five, five and a half million uh, Jews, not all of them by, the, by any means are supporters of Israel, but the organized communities around them who can control much of that community politically and in civil society and civil organizations are supporters of Israel. So that gives them an, an, an internal, uh, um, give them an internal power in which they can affect the, uh, domestic politics as well as the narrative that is being learned and heard by uh, uh, tens of millions of Americans. They do not have that inside track in China or in India, yet not that they're trying to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, uh, stop their relationship. Their relationship has accelerated with these top powers, particularly China, India, and Russia. And you could see that uh, uh, Netanyahu is probably the, the the leader, the political leader, who's, who's visited and talked to Putin uh, the most often. Uh, what are they talking about? Uh, certainly they are talking about deepening some kind of relationship or at least uh, dividing their uh, influence in the region or something. In other words, uh, Israelis will always try to stay ahead of the curve, try to uh, establish these networks and establish these relationships. Uh, but the United States now will, will, for the foreseeable future, would still be the number one power that Israel relies on. And I believe, regardless, at the end of the day, if that line is broken, if the United States turns against Israel 
I think for the, this is going to be a mortal uh, blow to Israel. Uh, I don't think Israel can survive many years if that happens uh, for many, many, many strategic reasons. I don't have time to go over them today, but certainly you can read uh, between the lines and what I mentioned in, in my presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor. Before I conclude, I have an, uh, the final question, and there's my question, uh, too. Uh, and regarding the, the wall, the discriminant uh, wall of Israel, which building now in, uh, in the occupied and the whole uh, land of Palestine. Uh, now we are living a trend uh, of building walls. Uh, for example, Tim Marshall, the author of the, the Prisoner of Geography uh, has written a new book, The Age of Walls. Uh, he mentioned this kind of a trend, a global trend. Uh, and he said, like a new protectionist uh, a trend uh, we are living now. Look to the United States, which uh, the great power, uh, it, which building now a wall in, uh, in the border with Mexico. And even the uh, the Europe the 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 EU, the EU now and now is and China the fire the wall of fire like they said and now uh, we see Israel like uh, support this kind of uh, of tendency and try to build a wall why because uh, like uh, try to protect themselves against the the downsides of uh, of globalization. Do you think Israel now is moving against the inevitable fate of uh, uh, of it? I mean, uh, like moving against the, the 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 movements of history. All the globalization now are effect or have a huge impacts and effects on all the world. And Israel cannot protect itself with this kind of uh, of walls. Uh, what do you think about it? Well, these walls are, are simply prison walls. These are walls built to keep the Palestinians in cages, in bigger towns and cities and villages, so that they cannot, they can be controlled. Every aspect of their life to be controlled. And of course, that's against how history is progressing. History is supposed to be knocking down walls. So what we have these, these uh, tendencies that are coming now and then. We see it in Europe, we see it today under, under Trump. And others, but I don't think that is the movement of history. You can build walls, but these walls will possibly separate human beings. But they can. What What is important is not the human beings. What's important is what's in the mind of the human beings. So if we can convince millions, tens of millions of people that Israel is an apartheid state, they start employing BDS tactics and others in order to boycott Israel, sanction Israel, uh, disinvest in Israel, uh, show Israel. Uh, uh, the, the true face of Israel, I think eventually that system cannot sustain itself. It will crumble, even with all the world in the, in, 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 uh, uh, in, in the world. We saw what happened in 1989 in the East Berlin Wall. It came down crumbling. Didn't, uh, that existed for over 27, 28 years. So walls are not means to defend yourself. Uh, you build racist ideologies and you build xenophobic practices. When these are knocked down, the physical walls would also be knocked down. Thank you, Professor, for, for, for this interesting lecture. Uh, uh, and uh, let me thank all the audience uh, to attend this, uh, this lecture. And I hope uh, we're going to have another lecture uh, in the future and discuss <coughs> many and uh, very and deeply these uh, this, uh, points. There are many points worth to to, uh, to discussion. Uh, tomorrow, let me uh, remind you, tomorrow we have another presentation by Dr. Abdullah Zidane uh, about what and civilization building, role in impact and opportunities. Thank you, Dr. Sami. Uh, again for this presentation and see you tomorrow inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.